Coming up next on the SPNN Forum, we have Alex Merritt, Vice President of Program Operations at Twin Cities Rise. Hi, I'm Martin Ludden, Executive Director of the St. Paul Neighborhood Network, and we're here live in the Kwame McDonald studio with Alex Merritt, Vice President of Program Operations for Twin Cities Rise. Alex, welcome to the forum. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what Twin Cities Rise is as an organization and what you all are up to? Absolutely. Twin Cities Rise is on a mission to transform lives of those uh, most impacted by racial and socioeconomic barriers mm -hmm. through personal empowerment, career training, and meaningful employment. So our whole effort is to make sure that, again, those that are in the most underserved communities mm -hmm. end up in financial stability through, through gainful employment. Gotcha. So, it's, so you're looking at helping folks find jobs. And what's kind of on the personal empowerment side, is that through the work, like, through finding a job, or how does that, how does that play no, for you? So guys? personal empowerment is, um, Twin Cities Rise is a signature element of that. I call it the secret sauce, if you will. And so beyond just getting a job, because yeah. it, in this day's market, getting a job is not that difficult. Right. Um, but personal empowerment is truly helping people have the tools and skills they need to truly take control of their life from the inside out. Gotcha. And by doing personal empowerment, again, it elevates all the elements of their life, their family, their community, their how they show up at work, yep. and then they are able to sustain yeah. um, um, the employment that they obtain. Sustain and be successful in that job mm -hmm. with the broad support and toolbox. You got it, Mark. Yeah, you got very it. Very cool. Um, so who specifically are you working with? Who are the underserved populations that you're most you know, working most with. And so the t traditional, um, when we talk about underserved, so again, so those who are unemployed, underemployed, have commun uh, have criminal backgrounds, mm -hmm. um, you know, histories of, uh, again, financial struggles and yep. things of that sort. So that, that community, so African-American, BIPOC community, mm -hmm. um, and, and the like, if you will, yeah. those that, again, who traditionally have been underserved in society, um, and like I said, or have run, it, run into some challenges throughout right. their journey and are looking to get back on a path of success and being able to have impact in their, in their lives and their community. Cool, and so I know you have a few tracks that you bring people through on the employment side. So I want to talk about those, but I want to also um, send it sort of the, you, you talk about personal empowerment being the sort of scaffolding around mm -hmm. the job skills. So what is what is that part of the programming look like? So everything, so we are, all of our programs are eight week trainings. Mm -hmm. And inside of every program we have, there is a personal empowerment element. So there, the, and the 21st century skill training. Gotcha. And so very specifically around making sure people, again, develop the soft skills and the hard skills yeah. required to be able to succeed in, um, in the employment path of their choice. And so all of our programs have, have the element of personal yeah. empowerment. And what are those what are those career tracks that you all work with? So we offer we offer four career pathways at this point. So call center training. So for those who want to get into customer yeah. service, um, facilities and maintenance. Okay. Um, Pathway is another one that we have. For those that are like, I'm not really exactly sure which one, you know, we right. have a My Road to Success program, which allows you to go through the same training, but then have a customized employment plan okay. for where you're looking to. And our newest track that is starting here in September is our diesel technician program that allows people, again, to go into to fields that are more on the technician side. Yeah. So, you know, as a, <laughs> I'm thinking about, you know, call centers, who are your, what employers are you working with? for the call center side of it. Yeah, so we have um, we have quite a few employer partnerships yeah. across the Twin Cities area. Um, so places like Target, mm -hmm. Daily Pay um, as well, again, and many others that support us in placing graduates from the program yeah. into their call center service. Yeah. I, once upon a time, I worked at a place that had a large call center presence, <laughs> and I remember, you know, I mean, it's like, it, it's a great place to start and work up in a company, mm -hmm. and you need so many soft skills to do it well. Yes, it's not just about you know hello, hello, and pushing buttons, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> completely, completely. And we make sure that through our program that you develop those skills, yeah. um, and then like then through our employer partnerships and mock interviews that you do. Yeah. Again, we make sure that you really are prepared to to be successful. Yeah. What does the diesel tech side of things look like? Because that's a newer program for you guys, right? It is just yep, just getting off the the ground. It's hands on, so that mm -hmm. all that 
training is hands on at the college that we are partnering with to, to again to prepare people for for work in in again in technician roles again pathways to whether that be mechanic pathways to an even deeper technical skills um, but it's a lot of hands on training that become that's important for starter roles and like I said, whether it be a car service place, um, a, a transit location mm -hmm. um, that has, you know, bigger diesel opportunities as well. So. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that like the diesel tech program, you're working with a college. Mm -hmm. Is that, do most of these programs live within a higher ed type institution or do you do some of them yourselves in-house or yeah. how does that go? So a lot of the training we do in-house, but all of them are partner and credential with one of the college. So uh, we partner with Hennepin Technical College. We partner with Dakota County mm -hmm. um, that certifies our training. And so that people come through it, they also end up with a certificate from those and they can use them for continuing education units at, at uh, many of the partner institutions we have. Nice. I didn't realize that they would like so you uh, ultimately you come out hopefully with you know the toolbox we talked about and a job but also a certificate yeah you also end up with a certificate yeah. from one of the the certifying organizations that we're partnering with and do those programs cost anything for your participants? Oh, that's a good question. So it, it's free, it, or as, as I say, it's offered at no cost. Okay. Um, there, nothing's ever <laughs> free, well, right? It's yep. no cost to those <laughs> that come into it. Um, it's made possible for us by the generous donations of our funders, our supporters, um, and the, the donations and grants that we get in. And so it's offered at no cost. Um, right. But I say, and by no way is this free to <laughs> to operate. But it is at no cost to those who attend. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to adopt that because I think it's such a good point, and like people. For Forget, I think about nonprofits sometimes that you know, like this is a business. Mm -hmm. We have to, you know, bring in more than we spend. Yes. <laughs> and even yes. if we are providing things at no, at cost, no cost to the participant, mm -hmm. there's still a very real cost to, to doing that work. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And I tell you all the time for those that um, you know, we call risers who come through the program. Yeah. So once they complete um, the risers, it's like it's like it, it is no cost. But again, their contribution to future risers right. is that they succeed, right? So, so the successful outcomes that those who come to our program get also is the thing that gives the, you know, those who sponsor and contribute to our organization, the confidence that it is a worthy investment. And we yeah. have a, in Twin Cities Rise has a major social return on investment. Right. So for every dollar we invest for those who end up in employment, I think it's, it's over $7. Yes. Um, and then, and it goes down from there at any point that people get to interact with our programming. Um, our echo tone analysis, so a third party analysis of our work indicates that there is still a social return yeah. on the investment that is, um, that's measurable and that again serves the community in a broad way. Yeah. That, I mean, absolutely, if, if you can take somebody out of you know, the justice system, which is expensive, and put them <laughs> in a place where they're you know, back on their feet and contributing. And Tax-paying citizens. Yeah, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that return on investment makes total sense. What are like? Do you have any good success stories for your? I like the risers or what is yeah. what you call? Yeah, <laughs> I call them. Right. We have plenty, plenty yeah. of success stories. So Twin Cities Rise has been around for almost thirty years at this point, and so we have many, many. But the one that comes to mind off the top um, is that many people are familiar with the Bush Fellowship mm -hmm. Program. So, but many people may not know that one of the twenty twenty two Bush Fellows that was just recently named Prince Corbett is actually a graduate of Twin Cities Rise. So he's also a riser. Came to our program two weeks after prison. Yeah. And today is a Bush Fellow, and so we, as a, we have again, Twin Cities Rise has a long track record of empowering people and making sure they're employment ready, and then them going on to do amazing things. The state of Minnesota um, is a benefactor as well, so many many risers work in government, uh, work in private sector, and so where our graduates go, um, there is a huge track record of success. Very cool. So, how do you find these folks? Are you out like? Recruiting individually? Do you have referring partners, or how does that? What does that look yes. like? Yes. Is the answer to all of that? <laughs> all of those things. <laughs> all of the all yeah. of the above, and we're and, and even doing things like this again to get the word out more. So Twin Cities Rise, like, and one of the things we say is like we're the best kept secret, but yep. we no longer want to be that right. um, because we really do have a program that is changing lives in a meaningful way. So we are at we we show up at community events um, mm -hmm. to collect information or connect with people there. We um, are online, so Facebook yep. is another way that people find out about about us, job boards, and things of that sort. Mm -hmm. um, and then word. Of mouth. So the risers that come through and succeed, they tell other people, yeah. and then we have we have that. But we're looking definitely to increase that pipeline of participants, if you will, right. um, because so that way we are able to serve. So the more people we get this in front of, more people that know that it's available mm -hmm. to them, then we're expecting the more successful outcomes we can create. Yeah. You mentioned the online part of what you're doing. How did your programming change 
during COVID? And did you, were you able to offer that programming online or how did you reach people? Absolutely, that's a, that's a really good point. So prior to the pandemic, Twin Cities Rise, like many organizations, was yeah. all in person. Yeah. And then when the pandemic hit, again, true to our name, again, truly was able to rise yeah. to yeah. the occasion and convert all of the programming to virtual, which is what it is today. Besides okay. the Diesel Tech, which like I said, is going back in person, yeah. but everything else is offered virtually. Um, and the benefit that we, the surprising benefit that we did not anticipate was the, how e the ease of access that it made for our participants. So it took away some of the, the hurdles that they typically have with transportation mm -hmm. or childcare. Now being able to do this from the comfort of their home or the comfort of wherever they are right. um, to be able to administer the program. So all of our programs are still virtual. Very cool. So that's going to continue. That will continue, as I say, for the foreseeable future. We will you know, continue to test you know, in person. But again, if we can, our goal is making sure that we make sure people are empowered and employment ready. And if yeah. we can do that effectively and continue to do so virtually, we will continue to serve right. people in that way. Is most of your service area, at least maybe pre-COVID, is most of your service area Twin Cities Metro, or how far out state do you We go? do the seven county metro. Okay. So we serve all the, the seven counties, and that still is our, um, our region of reach. Does the virtual transition allow you to work with folks farther afield? It will. It definitely yeah. will allow us to, to, do, to do that as well. Right now, currently, our focus is still the seven county metro, um, but as we think about scaling this impact in a broader way, the virtual model definitely allows us to do that yeah. more effectively. Very cool. Yeah, I think you know, we're finding some of that too. You know, when we get calls about a virtual event and people are asking what time zone it's in, it's like, <laughs> oh, hey, like we're, we're, reaching, <laughs> we're reaching beyond Minnesota. Absolutely, that, that does feel good. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I just lost my train of thought. So I'm going to do the, if you're just joining us thing, um, and we'll punch that out. Um, but we have covered a ton of ground in like 10 minutes. So also, um, what are some of the things, what do we want to come back and hit more about? It's how they enroll, how they yep. get, you know, place again, their background, maybe that kind of a Perfect. thing. Perfect. Yep. Covered and that is thing because again, I'm pretty succinct. Even if I'm, I can expound it. I'm, yep. I'm succinct in my <laughs> my delivery of things. And you're, so you're hitting all the points. Yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so we're gonna do that thing. Okay. If you're just joining us, we're here in the Kwame McDonald Studio at SPNN with Alex Merritt, Vice President for Program Operations at Twin Cities Rise. So, Alex, when you have um, folks that come through your programs, your risers. Um, how like how do they enroll and then once they've completed the program how do they get placed with an employer good question so the process is really straightforward and streamlined so like many things it's online so mm -hmm. first it starts with an application so going to our website and uh, and applying there so we have that you know must be 18 years of age to do that you know make under um fifty five thousand dollars which most you know for a family of four and then you know some more specifics right. there um so you, you fill out an application once that goes through, then you'll get a another. You'll get a message that's like, "Congratulations, that went through." Basically, <laughs> yep. um, and then um, you'll get you know more uh, uh, an assessment to fill out. You'll complete that, and then you'll get a call from somebody in our outreach team. Um, you'll be invited to an info session to get, again to learn more about the program to make sure you're you know you're signed up for the right program. And then when classes start, you start um, in, in there. And then for the eight weeks of the of training program again, so you are in there where you get personal empowerment, 21st century career skills. Throughout that, you'll be where you'll get. I mean, you'll get a coach, a personal coach to help you with wow. your own um, employment plans, your development, your goals, and so to help you with any supportive services you might need yeah. throughout that. So, Twin Cities Rise is a very hands-on, yeah. very high-touch, um, transformational program that ensures again that we support people as they go through. So that they again they, they meet the successful criteria after the eight week program is up, then they graduate to what we call the career club, okay. and then you'll get to work with an employment specialist there. You'll be introduced to employers. Um, you'll get the opportunity to fill out applications, and then again they continue to partner with you until your first day of meaningful employment. And once you get meaningful employment, we're like, yay! It doesn't <laughs> stop there though. <laughs> No, nope. <laughs> and that no, we continue on. So then we will continue to stay with you through. Then you get connected to our retention coach to be able to make sure again that you're getting the continued empowerment support. You get access to our app, um, which um, gives you empowerment 24/7. So that's super fun. And then at the one year mark which is that even the bigger celebration for us is that yeah. we have a bell ringing. And so you get to ring the bell to, cool. to celebrate your success. 
That's, yeah, that's, and like a year, the first year in anything is, <laughs> it's definitely the hardest. <laughs> yep, and, you, and we're there with you the whole time, yeah. and then even beyond that, to two year mark and beyond. So Twin Cities Rise, as we say, it's kind of like when you think about colleges, um, yeah. you know, I, I, I joke around all the time, it's probably not sanctioned by anybody. I was like, we're the Yale for those who've been, you know, through <laughs> hardship and or jail, right? right? So we are the Yale to help people do that. <laughs> but get you, you have a support team yeah. behind you at Twin Cities Rise for life. Um, and so even if they're, you know, after your one year on employment, if you're looking for something different, again, being able to plug back into our right. career center is um, our employment specialist team is really um, available to you. Cool. So you mentioned when classes start. So does this program run like with the academic year or is this something that you can start whenever and just kind of take it through its cycle or how does that work? Yeah, so we have, so we offer each, each of the pathways at various times and like I said in our info sessions they um, bring up, but they usually offer like once a month okay. depending on what the program, like so in September I have several, several pathways starting okay. and depending on which one um, is of most interest or that if somebody qualifies for then again they are, they're able to start them within, like I said, within a month or yeah. six weeks of each other. So you mentioned, I think I heard uh, an initial coach and then employment counselor, and mm -hmm. then did you call it a retention coach? Yep. So who are those folks? Are they all staff or some of them they volunteers? Are all, they're all staff in Twin okay. Cities Rise that are dedicated to the success of the risers that are coming through, and you cool. just get access to them at different stages of yeah. the of the program. And that's not even including the instructor that actually teaches like the 21st right. century skills and the personal yeah. empowerment. So you also get connected to the instructors as well um, while you're doing classes. So classes are usually like 90 minutes okay. for four days a week during that eight week period. And then you get to go into the career club um, once you like that, once you finish that eight week cycle, gotcha. so and then that's a whole other coach that takes you through. Yeah. So, so you get all the support you need. Yeah, where do those folks come from? You know, your your coaches and stuff. Do they have? You know, are these folks that have? You know varied careers beforehand or like I just think that sounds like a really fulfilling piece of work to do. It is a very fulfilling piece of work and and with Twin Cities Rise there's a couple of things so once so some of the, the coaches that are in our program actually were former risers or are risers indeed nice. so they again we hire them into the program so that is that's a, a subset. Then there are people who have been to your point in various careers like myself yeah. I'm in the organization now but again spent 18 years at, um, at a Fortune 500 company prior yeah. to I'm an engineer by degree <laughs> and so a lot of people come from different walks of life, yeah. but all with one commitment to this mission of helping people rise to their full potential. Nice. I've worked with some engineers in different capacities. <laughs> uh, what, do you, what does that bring to kind of a, a program role like you're in now? You know, it's, fun. It, it's the, you know, it's like engineers solve problems no matter what yep, kind of problems right. they are. So that's what, that's what that brings. But then also process improvement. Um, and so clear, repeatable processes that yep. allow us to ensure that confidently, no matter when you start the program, your experience through the program is, you know, is similar from a success standpoint. And more than that, your outcome, the track of your outcomes also, that that part is, is process oriented. So, that, so as an engineer, that's what I get to bring to, to the program is ensuring that A plus B equals C. Right. Uh, um, and, and so, C today and tomorrow and, <laughs> and next the next and, and next, next month exactly yeah. that's exactly right and so and like I said, Twin Cities Rise has done a phenomenal job over over the years of, of being able, like I said, to have a successful track record um, for for participants coming through. Mm -hmm. And it really, for me, is just helping systematize that <laughs> in a in a um, as only engineers can, I guess. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know that's definitely that's not my brain. Yes. <laughs> but I'm glad there are people out there doing this work with that brain. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. You've, um, one of the populations you've talked about working with and the, the riser that's the Bushfellow, um, these are folks that are coming through the system with a record. So mm -hmm. what is that, like, do those, does that bring special challenges? I think it brings special urgency, but mm -hmm. what are the challenges working with those, with folks that have a record and getting them placed and supported? Yeah, so like, so in broader society, right? So we understand, yeah. we know the, the stigmas or the challenges mm -hmm. with that, like I said, and um, what many people may not know is that Twin Cities Rise um, also helped partner and to, to author the Fair Chance Hiring Guide. So we, I mean, so in addition to our programs being one where we're looking to be able to get people placed to have backgrounds or working with yeah. employers there, but we also, in a broader sense, are working on influencing policies procedures and practices in the workforce to be able to make it easier for people to to enter into employment because you know our thing is again you can empower people's lives and make sure that they're successful and once you pay your debt to society then mm -hmm. you've paid your debt to society right. and so therefore 
it should not keep you out of re-entering and reconnecting in a successful way to society. So we have a lot of great partners that um, our Empowerment Institute and our Vice President of Business Development, Jacqueline Carpenter, leads um, and has done a tremendous job in making sure that we, we are working with employers and that we have places that people who have criminal histories um, where they can successfully go. Yeah. So the, the, this is like, that's very direct advocacy. Mm -hmm. And like not maybe, or maybe it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are you doing, um, or is your team working on advocacy like at legislative levels or is mm -hmm. it primarily like business to business kind of advocacy? So business to business for sure. The Fair Chance Hiring Guide has gone beyond that. Um, and then also having discussions at higher levels as well. And so we are definitely advocating and working yeah. to make sure that we can, um, to, like I say, in, in, to quote Jacqueline Carpenter, like that our vice president of business development is that again, people are looking for talent. Yeah. but they're overlooking the talent that is available right. because of some of the strict requirements or stringent um, criteria that have been put in place against people who potentially have criminal backgrounds. And so she does a really great job in helping elevate. And I highlight the ideas like, oh, you're looking for talent. Here is talent. Yes. <laughs> yes. How do we make sure that you know, talent has the opportunity, if you will, to, to serve the organization as well as serve themselves in society? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit, so it's the Fair Chance Hiring Guide, mm -hmm. and I know, you know, I was familiar, there was a movement a couple years back about Ban, ban the, the Box. box. Mm -hmm. Is that part of that, and what other parts are there? Yeah, so that, so that is a part of, that is a part of, so I get ready to the, the box, and like I said, and this might be me punching against my, above my weight class, That's actually. But the Fair Chance Hiring Guide also provides um, employers with insight and instructions to be able to, you know, how they assess talent, mm -hmm. you know, what to look for, how to ensure that as we're bringing people on with um, backgrounds, again, yeah. that they have to, you know, they understand the risk, if any, um, mm -hmm. that may, may show up. And so some, a lot of it, honestly, is changing the mindsets of people yep. as it relates to those yeah. who may have had um, criminal backgrounds. Because again, some of the practices and policies and things we put in place are just that, things we put in place. Yeah. They may or may not have any bearing on the success rate of someone. Right. I mean, and with Twin Cities Rise, like I said, we did a third party analysis that talked about social return on investment. Mm -hmm. It also talks about people who've come through this program have, you know, a 27, 28 um, percent less or lower recidivism rate yes. than other people. And so, you know, or they are, you know, four, four to five times more likely to be retained on the job. So again, so if you're looking for a high retention, yeah. then again, hiring someone who has a criminal background and having it be in a place that's um, viable and supportive of who they are as a person, yeah. um, from a retention standpoint, it actually sets you up as a better business decision than right. <laughs> than not. So yeah, well, that's that's like that's all like those are great data points. Um, just by way of explanation, can you if you if you know it, can you talk a little bit about what ban the box means? Because I think we both. No, we just kind of zinged over it. So what is yeah. that? So ban, so ban the box, the, the ideology behind that is right. Is, is, it's like not asking, because some of it is like this need to check a box, right. you know, for all the roles. It's like, for what though, right? So yeah. again, so everybody doesn't have their past on display when they go into a job. Yeah. And so to, unless there's something specific in a background that you are looking for right. or that impedes someone from doing the job, then there is no reason that somebody has to volunteer this right. information about especially if you're using it as a place to to eliminate someone yeah. out the out the gate so um, that box on the job application that says like have you ever been convicted of a say, felony yeah. or something like that and it's like why why <laughs> yeah. why for right. for this job and like i said everybody can still run background checks most people do can do run background yeah. checks and so um but again making this specific to to the action, because again, everybody who has not been convicted of a felony does not mean they have not committed a felony. Right. That's very, that is very fair. The question is not, have you been indicted? Yeah. It's, you know, yeah. yeah. I love that too, like, and it, it, makes, it makes really good sense to me that once you place someone like that, like, they are more likely to stay. Yeah, because it's harder yeah. to get into the basis. Right. So if you if you get an opportunity, um, and I think like that, it becomes this re, it's just re, not even so much reimagining, but just reconsidering some of the policies, the systemic policies that work yep. to keep people out yeah. of successful 
places. I mean, that's really what it comes down to when you think about that. So it's just challenging some of the, the practices that, um, that again, inherently are discriminatory. Yep. Yeah. And we've talked about that here at mm -hmm. SPNN too. And it's, you know, for us, it's been a lot of reevaluating like educational requirements. Mm -hmm. Like, does this job really require a bachelor's degree? Like, really? Why? Who said? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So now it's, you know, or equivalent, you know, like, Tell us what you've been up to. If you've yeah. been in the field for 10 years and you don't have a bachelor's degree, okay, you're probably better off than a brand new graduate. <laughs> you know, like, come yeah. on down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's what it is. It's just really challenging and checking in. Yeah. Why was the practice put in place to begin with? Right. And then who is it impacting? Yep. And and with any of these, and we, you know, we talk about, and this has not, not even so much, but just the idea, right, if we talk about creating a more equitable society, yeah. as we talk about, you know, equity on all the levels, especially economic equity, is just realizing that some of the practices that are in place, that are commonplace, right. are also inherently discriminatory. Yeah. The catch, though, is that because it's, it seems to be benign, right. it, um, you know, again, it's, it's such a part of the fabric and the fiber of the American culture at yeah. times that you, me, and other people just being willing to go, why? Right. <laughs> Yeah. becomes a really powerful explore, exploration in us being able to make things more, more equitable in yeah. society. What's well, the systemic part of mm -hmm. systemic it's the, racism? It's the right? systemic you part. Know, yeah, it's it the takes, systemic part. <laughs> <laughs> and it, like, there's inertia there, and it takes, um, it takes real intention to push against that inertia. And it seems that Twin Cities Rise is also doing, you know, we can do some of that work ourselves, but to have a trusted partner also step up and say, like, yeah. I want to take a look at that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> examine the why on that one. Exactly. <laughs> and here's how and here's the benefits and here's what it yeah. can and can look like because again I think is that it's like to your point it's just challenging that and knowing that we all have a responsibility yeah. to make sure that we are again that we are promoting a fair and equitable society mm -hmm. and Twin Cities Rise is definitely doing a fair their fair share of of that by making sure people have the skills and are trained. Um, the employer side, the community side is making sure that again, when people show up there, that they are welcomed into the environment with no, with no downsides. Yeah, that's, I, we hadn't even touched on that. We probably won't have time, but you know, there's always, you know, people talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think sometimes they focus on the diversity and equity and forget the inclusion part. Because mm -hmm. if you don't have inclusion down, then Whatever racial or other diversity you manage to bring in. Yeah. It's like pouring water in a bucket with a hole. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. you can fill the bucket. Yeah. <laughs> However, you it's can't keep the but you can't keep it full. Yeah. And so that's some of what um, you know, as we think of again, society as a yeah. as a broad deal, like I said, and that's why I appreciate the work you guys are doing. It's just yeah. bringing bringing awareness because some of it really is just challenging what we think is true. And once you challenge that, then it become it opens up the door for, for more opportunities yeah. to come forward for us. Yeah. So if somebody wants to start an application or find more information, what's the best place to do that? Yep. So visit us at TwinCitiesRise.org is definitely the place. You can always give us a call at our offices <laughs> at 612-338-0295. Cool. Someone will happily take you. But TwinCitiesRise.org is the easiest way. Go into the application there, and then somebody from our outreach team will be in touch. Alex, thank you so much for your time here uh, and for the work you're doing and for the work that Twin Cities Rise is doing. Thank you so um, much for having me. It's been a pleasure to have yeah, the conversation. I enjoy it. Thank you so much. Yeah. We have been here in the Kwame McDonald studio at SPNN with Alex Merritt, the Vice President of Program Operations at Twin Cities Rise. Please check in and see us again sometime. Thanks. That was great. Yeah, thanks. Yeah.